Right, hello everybody and welcome to San Francisco Independent Short Film Festival. I'm Ian Bignall from Festival Formula and today we will be speaking to some of the filmmakers featured in an animated world which is always my soft spot. I love animation. Some of the most creative inventive storytelling exists in animation um, and we are lucky to have so many people on one call for well half an hour um, but First, first thing is first, I'd like everybody just to quickly introduce themselves, their name, their film, and what role they had on the film. So let's start with you, Thomas. Yes, my name is Thomas, Thomas Reinhold, and I made the film Don't Know What, and actually I, I did the concept, the uh, editing, um, uh, but I had a cameraman who was very helpful and, uh, and a sound engineer, but yeah, that's it. Nice. And then Peter with The Passerby. Uh, yes, I am Peter, the director of The Passerby. I directed the film. I did the backgrounds, the script, the storyboard, and um, I, I'd say about 50% of the animation. Oh, wow, many hats. Um, Mary? My name is Mary Alpec. Uh, I am the writer, producer, director of The Cat, which is a political message internationally for women's position. Um, particularly women's position in Iran. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I have created the project, but the animators, I had other animators working on it. Okay, awesome. And David? Hi, uh, I'm David uh, Diva. I was the art director and compositor for the animated short film, Firstborn. Nice. And Justin? Hi, I'm Justin Lee. I am the director, the storyboard artist for uh, anime short film, Firstborn. Fantastic. And Carlo? Uh, hi, I'm Carlo Andrea Conte, and uh, uh, I made uh, Blue Dwarf Stale. Uh, I was alone on that, so a little bit of everything. <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> and finally, John. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so my name's John Portman. Um, I was the writer and director and primary illustrator and animator for Malady of Mine. Fantastic. Well, welcome one and all. Let's start with a very simple icebreaker question just to get everybody warmed up. Um, so if you had to be, uh, or had to talk like a cartoon character for the rest of your life, who would that be? Prominent question to ask everybody in the, uh, as, as animators and in that kind of world. Anyone? <laughs> Otherwise I'm gonna start picking on people. I'll Tell be Bugs Bunny. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> We'll know you from distance in the crowd, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anybody else? I grew up with it, but it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. I, I, would, I would be Keith Wiggum from The Simpsons. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good yeah. one. The best character from The Simpsons. <clears throat> I, was going, I was going to say Homer Simpson, so. Yeah, uh, Simpsons are great. <laughs> I guess I'm the older generation. <laughs> <laughs> with the Bugs Bunny. <laughs> oh my god. I'd have to go with the classic Mickey Mouse. You can't go wrong. Sure. I'll go with Donald Duck. <laughs> I think I will be... I could do Yoda. <laughs> you? <laughs> what about Not you, bad. Thomas? I, I don't know. No? No one? No. I, I don't think I'm, I, I can find a fitting one, really. I'm, I'm not so much interested in, in cartoon characters. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh -huh. Their own. I'll, 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 I'll fill, it, fill in for you. I'll be Captain Caveman. Uh, <laughs> and limited dialogue. Uh, so I'll be Captain Caveman on your behalf. <laughs> right, Thomas, we'll start with you because your film is probably the most different from all of the films in the animation block in terms of it's not traditional animation. You have a live action um, and the animated part of it is essentially the editing uh, and the way it's edited by animating yourself uh, through the, your, your editing choices. Uh, maybe you just want to start to fill everyone in in terms of how the film came about and how you chose to make the film that we are watching right now? Um, well, I made another film before. It was called Sunny Afternoon, which was, and I, I started to experiment there with uh, editing, um, editing um, a, a short serial of photographs and, and then I wanted to expand it. 
And so this is kind of a follow-up of this Sunny Afternoon film. And yeah, I, I was very interested to, to explore what is possible with single frame editing starting from a live action movie. But in fact, I started, uh, I was firstly concentrated on the sound. So in fact, I started editing the sound because I was very interested in, this, in experimenting with this. And then the, um, um, the, the picture had to follow because I always cut the sound and the, and the image simultaneously. Yeah? So it, first of all, it was, I would say about the, it was a piece of music. And generally, generally speaking, I would say I'm, I'm very interested in avant-garde film and experimental film. But sometimes I feel avant-garde film is very elitarian and very serious and, and, and for a kind of closed audience. So I wanted to try to combine avant-garde film with entertainment. So I'm asking the question, is it possible to be entertaining with an avant-garde film? And on the other side, uh, are animation festivals ready to, to see my experiment? So I, I, I simply wanted to mix avant-garde and, and entertainment and see if it's possible, yeah. Well, I think it definitely is. I think you've made your own genre. I mean, it it's really is something very, very different. Um, I mean, experimental is a very difficult area anyway, because what is experimental? And I think anyone can answer that one of about five different ways if you really wanted to. Your film is definitely experimental, but I was really impressed by the fact that it's got such an impressive rhythm all the way through your film, this kind of to and fro, backwards and forwards, and even the way you set up your end credits with the table being put on its side and spinning that round. By the end of it, I felt like I'd been on like a roller coaster. It's such a it's such an intense experience watching your film. Are you are you uh, were, are you totally happy with the way that it came out? Was it was it what you were uh, imagining your film would look like at the end? Well, the the the. Um... The key point of artistic work for me is not to know at the beginning what would be the result. So if I say I don't know what I'm doing, it's also kind of a serious comment about my filmmaking. I, I, I know a little bit what, I mean, I, I know approximately where I want to go, but the, uh, what I like is to discover things when I'm working on the, on the project. And mm. like there are many things I, I didn't know uh, when I started that they would come up. But yeah, I'm extremely, extremely satisfied with the results. But yeah, I, I also worked a lot on it. So I, I spent a lot of time and I, I had many, many versions which I threw away at the end. And, and then I selected just uh, the most interesting parts. Let's, let's put it like that. Yeah, and you were saying to me before uh, we recorded this that you've had more, more success with actually animation festivals um, uh, than you have experimental festivals. Has that been a surprise for you? Or is that, is that actually something you're just accepting that actually people are looking more at this, uh, maybe less artistically, but more from an animation-y style? I, I, I'm, I was surprised about the success at animation festivals, but my answer so far is, I think uh, there, is, there is humor in the film and there are surprises and you can laugh. And I think that is the door opener for animation festivals. If you entertain the audience, it's more easy. But it seems to me a little bit that the avant-garde film festivals, they, they have a problem with humor. That's, that's my impression or my result of, of, yeah. In a way, I think that it, it's, it, it's like that a little bit. Yeah, I think they can be quite picky with what they want to have <laughs> experimental festivals. I think we've, uh, we as a company have submitted many experimental films to experimental festivals all over the world and they're very, very particular with what they want. Yeah. They're obviously making a block, a short block, so everything else has got to work around it. So it's weird, you can make a film that really stands out, but sometimes it can stand out too much and maybe that's the case, the case with your film. But yeah. I still really enjoyed it. I thought it was a fantastic... Uh, approach to uh, experimental work and animation. So well done on making something very, very different and quite punchy. Uh, Peter, I'm going to move on to you next with the yeah. passerby. Uh, <clears throat> I was, <laughs> I really didn't know where this was going because you, it starts off as one thing and then the middle of your film is a, just a wondrously beautiful thing where it's 
like the camera work with it, it's very fluid and floaty and moving around. You've got a real appreciation for background and foreground and what's in the middle in terms of that's where your, so your story sits. Uh, the music drives it along as well. And it's a, an, a point A to a point B, back to a point A, back to a point B kind of scenario. <laughs> yes. There's so much going on that I was, I kind of was just swept away by the story that you're telling. I mean, where, where did the story originate from? Hopefully not from something real and hopefully in your head, but if, if not, I stand corrected. <laughs> uh, you stand corrected. Um, it's actually something, uh, when I was very young, I think about nine years old or something, uh, we lived at a very busy street, not that kind of street, but in like a very, in the middle of the city. And um, when I walked out of the door to go to, uh, to school, right in front of my, my face, uh, a kid was just uh, run over by a car. And so, of course, that made a big impression upon me. And uh, um, especially when I had to go to school. So I just walked around the corner and I kind of realized that life just goes on and just life doesn't stop because some kid mm -hmm. died. And mm -hmm. this this thing uh, always stayed with me. And um, so, yeah, it's... It, the, the 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 core or, or the the source of this is this film is like more than 20 years old but yeah. I, I made it now because i thought i just found the right form to to tell mm -hmm. the story in because it's a very simple story it's, it's a very basic thing it's nothing uh out of the ordinary unfortunately um but yeah That's i thought it was quite interesting because um the way that you past time and, and, and make the story move on is by traveling it's such a it's such an interesting concept because every time you're cycling you're like oh i wonder what blah 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 is going to be doing there and i wonder what what's what's going to be happening at the accident scene i think that it's a really eff affecting film because you bookend it obviously inside to or slightly outside buildings yeah. uh, and and with the characters that are sort of intertwining in this uh, horrible accident um, it's just a really well balanced film. I, I was I was wondering um, the I mean I'm not an animator myself, but the creative process that you that you use to make the the camera work so fluid, like you actually felt like someone was holding the camera. How did you go about that? Uh, it was hell, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but prior to actual production, I did a complete animatic, including the the zoom ins, the zoom outs. So everything was perfectly, uh, I could pace it the way I wanted it. So it's kind of a low res animatic, uh, which then of course had to be turned into a high def uh, finished project, which was um, quite uh, challenging. Um, we, I think we had a, like a, a, a photo, I basically made the street in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, how many pixels wide it was, but it was ridiculous. And um, so, <laughs> It, it was basically just um, tracking the character. I couldn't, by the way, um, test the animation in real time. I had to render for, in order to see it. And it was a seven hour render. So each time I did, I, I changed something. I had to wait seven hours to see the result, then realize that it was completely fucked and then had to <laughs> change it again, render out for several, several, uh, seven hours and so on. So it was, um, yeah, it was very, very challenging. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be that, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, I always, I always look at animations and think that actually being an animator must be the most rewarding and frustrating thing in the world because of the attention to detail that you have to throw into everything that you do. I think, I think animators are, are kind of masochists in a way. <laughs> you have to be kind of masochistic to be an animator. <laughs> Otherwise, you just don't. <laughs> I think I, mean, if I, was, I, I always look at things like Wallace and Gromit or you know Nightmare Before Christmas and I just look at it and go especially especially with stop motion I just look at it and go like if that was me I'll do like five frames and then just walk into the sea and never come back again kind of thing I just <laughs> don't think I'll be able to cope with actually doing it for that long so big respects to you guys out there for being able to have the patience to do your craft uh, John actually has a question uh, he's just thrown into the into the mix now uh, to you Peter, which is how long did the film take you start to finish? Uh, it took about 12 months to to realize the film, um, which was a lot longer than we anticipated. In the beginning, everybody was telling me, well, four or five, six months. 
you know, it's just one camera move. You only need one background. So uh, it'll be a quick film, film to make. But of course, 12 months later, we finished it. So, so 12, yeah. 12 months, 12 months, 12 months. Or 12, 12 to 15 months, I think, to post-production and everything. 15 uh, months. And, 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 and you aging maybe five years during that 12 months to make it. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, turned gray and everything. So. <laughs> Well, well done. I thought it was a really tremendous, uh, tremendous film and uh, visually beautiful. Uh, so well done to you, Peter. Uh, Mary, so you have the cat, which, uh, first of all, uh, I thought looked absolutely beautiful because it's a mixture. It's mainly black and white with a little bit of colour involved in it here and there. Um, and I was really uh, transfixed with this sort of shadow uh, chasing after the child in terms of the, the way it kind of absorbs all the sort of the good things in the world. Uh, where, was the, what, where was the origins of this story come from when you created this animation? Uh, well, I am uh, Iranian mm -hmm. and I left at the time of the revolution in Iran with a background of acting, producing and um, second generation actor. Um, so I found my ways through the past four decades in order to expose the situation that existed there, either it was via theater or cinema or television. So I've been an activist via my form of work. Uh, either it's been a play uh, titled Beneath the Veil or in movies that I have created, feature films that I've created. There has always been a message for women, for the situation in the Middle East, particularly the situation in Iran, and uh, the brutality that exists in that particular region and, and the country due to the government that they have. Um, so animation has always been a favorite of mine, but I have never touched it. And as, so I came up with the idea because of the journey that I have taken as a woman, as an Iranian woman, um, through the years and to see what is happening in Iran and what is happening in the region. And then the Me Too movement came by. Um, so all of these influences, uh, I decided to make it through animation because it's a very powerful form of art. Uh, so uh, the idea of the little girl running away from this large shadow uh, that she's selling flowers in the streets of Tehran and mm -hmm. all the elements. And then I brought in all the other aspects of what's happened in Iran for the past 40 years with the trafficking, with prostitution, with, with the brutality of the regime, with, uh, with how music has gone away and they're actually throwing the instruments into the, in the hot um, uh, area. So it all burns and, and her trying to find the courage in order to stand up to this. Uh, mm -hmm. at the end of her run, uh, which eventually she does through some inner insight and she wants to fight and she wants to go to a glorious world. Um, so every bit of this animation was directed and uh, written, created by um, conceptually and as far as the material is concerned by me. I didn't do the actual animation because I'm not an animator, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to explore this concept with the world in, in a matter of nine, 10 minutes and say, this is what the real world is in that region yeah. and pay attention to it and a reflection of that. Yeah, I mean, because corruption is one thing that you really highlight in it because you have these kind of like evil, uh, sinister characters. They almost look like, uh, like No Face from you know, Studio Ghibli uh, kind of thing in terms of like these haunting spirits that are kind of wandering around. Um, I was really kind of like, I mean, I, I think, I took a sweeping view of what is almost like a reflection of capitalism in a way, in terms of like sucking, sucking the, the freedom and the, exp the artistic nature of society out and then turning it into something else and taking that creative energy and burning it in something that's really just not that useful. It's almost like fueling the machine, so to speak. Again, was that sort of another approach of that? Was capitalism another side to the story that you wanted to tell? Because I kind of got that corporate feel from it as well. Well, I am not necessarily going to say capitalism, mm -hmm. but I would say that the general feel and the nuances and the dynamics of the world, in particular in the past 40 years, since the revolution happened in Iran, which changed the world literally on multitude of levels in many different ways. It affected the neighboring countries. It affected the Europe. It, if, it affected the Islamic concept. It affected 9-11 situations, suicide bombers, trafficking, um, prostitution that is a very high level in Iran. So my journey as an artist um, 
if I can call myself an artist, is that I have absorbed all that and I have, I have reflected on, on the screen of cinema or theater, but I've never done it in a via animation. And I realized that how much place I have in animation more to create this. And it fascinated me. Actually, I'm working on another project for animation now. And I, I don't call myself an animation filmmaker uh, or an animator, but as far as conceptually, the whole idea of what happened around us in the past 40 years, which affected me as a young woman when I came to the United States with the hostage crisis, with so much challenges that I had personally, I couldn't say that I was from Iran. I was just saying I'm a good human being and I somehow survived and started making movies and doing the theater and all that. But this is a fantastic format in order to communicate with the audience um, animation of the troubles in the world. And I definitely wanted to have a happy ending to it uh, because I think we have so much, particularly with the Me Too movement, um, since I felt that women are standing up for themselves and what a wonderful thing that has happened in which we can actually project our inner inner power. And, mm -hmm. and that's why this little girl against all the darkness that is coming towards her, she, she fights it and she conquers and she goes to the beauty of life and starting a new, a new life. Now, I think it's important as well because um, we need to hear more Iranian and Middle Eastern stories because it's become, it's, it's become very difficult to always get Iranian films into the US, into Europe. Uh, it's complicated for many, many different reasons. So the fact that voices are being heard from that region, important stories, uh, and also to highlight and echo what you just said about animation. I think animation, you're only limited by your mind, um, you know, and, and essentially you can make a blank piece of paper you know, turn into something beautiful Precisely. And, and, and make it what you need it to be, where sometimes I think live action can be very costly to try and uh, recreate mm -hmm. what's in your mind. So I think animation is a very interesting, certainly a more artistic uh, approach to storytelling. And I definitely think that your film definitely ticks a lot of those boxes and it's a joy to watch. So thank you very much, Mary. Thank you. David, firstborn. So firstborn, I mean, I, I'm an only child, so I, I don't suffer from this problem, but uh, I'm sure there's many brothers and sisters out there that have this internal uh, fight to try and get uh, the favourable side of dad or mum, uh, as the case may be in some cases. Um, and I just thought this was absolutely uh, a beautiful take on that. It's a very short moment in time in terms of telling that story. Is that echoing from somewhere that you came from in your childhood, or is that something you just wanted to write about? Um, so it was actually, I mean, I'm a twin, so I, I definitely could relate to the story a lot with my competitive nature with my brother. Um, but the story originated from actually Justin and uh, our other roommate, Eric's uh, personal story, mostly Eric's personal story, our third roommate, um, and his relationship with his sister. So actually, I'll, I'll bump it over to Justin. He actually has a better yeah. answer for this one. It's an open, it was an open-ended question, to be fair, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, our roommate, Eric, he's our animation supervisor. And so he has a younger sister who's doing really well academically and her dance competitions. And then when he was back at home in LA, you see all his mom always praising her and all that. And, you know, Eric, he's always happy for the sister and loves her. But, you know, you know, being the firstborn, having that pressure of, Know, being the best of the you know the bunch and then so the, when the mom looked at Eric one day she said this line I really I could I could feel that for Eric where she said you know Eric it's okay if you're not number one <laughs> and then Eric's like uh because you know he can't help but like uh but then mm -hmm. I say like why can't we actually take this feeling and put it in a short film because I feel like a lot of children or kids out there are dealing with the pressure of being you know the best out of the siblings or just being overshadowed by the younger sibling but then in our show we also want to show that it's not a hateful relationship either because they are just you know they love each other so much they just want to be happy for each other and that's where my kind of little experience comes in where I'm an only child too and then if I had a younger sister that's like my ideal kind of relationship I want with the little sister Mm -hmm. And then I want to mix my Kung Fu background when I used to do competitions back in high school. So that's how we made Firstborn, getting that feeling and using Kung Fu as a whole story. 
nice and nice. And, and let's face it like a sports story is always a great a great entertaining way of telling uh, any any narrative as well because it really gets the audience stuck in the moment because really it, the the emotion comes through uh, at the end of it um and uh sports and emotions uh, cover all at the end of the day cover all bases um i wanted to talk as well very uh, very quickly as well on your uh, your animation style as well. I mean, it's like a, almost like a hand-drawn kind of element going on here. Um, how long did it take to draw something so painstaking? Uh, did you have breakdowns? Did you sleep? Uh, that kind of stuff. How? What was the process like? So, okay. So it was actually, uh, it was stressful. Um, I would say actual production for the five-minute short film was about three months, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, we, it was a senior project for our school, so we had to have it done by May. And um, because um, I was employed during that fall semester, I didn't have time to work on it. And um, we didn't have the story figured out until uh, like about December. So we had like between January and May, three or four months, we had to finish it. So um, lots of breakdowns. Where did Justin go? Um, but we were all roommates. So it was me, Justin, and our third roommate, Eric. Um, we all lived together in one room, uh, and we all worked together on a single desk uh, in that same room. And because of the pandemic, we had nothing else to do. So uh, we were working there from 9 a.m. till 3 a.m. in the morning. Yep. And uh, we just ate, slept, and drank uh, animation. So wow. it was very bonding. <laughs> I can't imagine how like like your life must have been just mental doing this. It's just I, I always yeah. I always say to filmmakers that aren't in animation, they're like, oh why is animation so short? And I'm like, do you know how long it takes just to do a minute? <laughs> like like six months. <laughs> it's like and all the stresses that go into making animation. But I guess with the pandemic, one thing we've seen as a company is people have been able to finish films and uh, write films and stuff. So I guess using the pandemic in a positive light to be able to uh, to create something beautiful and uh, and something beautiful you have made at the end of it I mean that I mean you you've got a cut out behind you uh, Justin I mean it's just it's a really beautiful flowing uh, flowing film um, and are you absolutely delighted with how it turned out I mean I, I hope you are because it's a really cracking film oh, thank you so much yeah I think we are really satisfied with what we have because in the beginning like it was just me and Eric. And so I was really happy that David joined and helped make the final look of First Form because I was just planning to make it black and white and the Kung Fu just color. So like with David coming on board, it's all colorful and all this 3D camera moves and all of that. So yeah, I mean, yeah. And we, you know, like, I think we, we always want to improve for our mm -hmm. art because, but with the amount of time we have, you know, this is the best we can do. But hopefully in our future animation stuff, we'll just keep getting better and better. So Yeah. And, and, and has uh, any young audiences that you know have seen this film? Or what's, have you heard any, had any feedback from young audiences watching this so far? Do you not know? Um, I haven't talked. I haven't actually, I don't think I've shown it to anybody uh, young. young. Have you, Justin? Yeah. I, I showed it to my girlfriend's little sister. She liked the Kung Fu and everything. <laughs> I mean, I think. <laughs> I think right now is this resonating with more of our our age group right now because it reminds of them of their past. But mm -hmm. I think with kids right now, maybe they don't get it maybe at first. But right now they maybe just like love the kung fu and stuff. But maybe when they get older, they will understand like, oh, this this how I felt I, as a sibling, you know. But oh, I only I only asked this in case you submitted to like youth or children's festivals and you had. Uh, some experience there but if you haven't definitely do submit it to you from children's festivals because they'll love it uh, as well as animation festivals um, because I can tell you for a fact I can probably rattle off about five festivals that will be really interested in your film uh, but anyway it's really a uh, really accomplished piece well done well told story beautiful tick 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 on well, well done to you guys thank, thank you, you so much no worries uh, Carlo a blue dwarf's tale um, wow, what a feast for the eyes this was. Uh, I was, uh, I, 
I had to sit down and have like a drink afterwards because it was like a full on like sonic attack on the eyes and the ears. But I guess that was what you were going for because it's a rhythmic display of beauty. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, it was. Um, it was. It, the, the music was actually the the source of it, uh, mm. quite literally. Um, I first uh, made the music and then. I would say most of the video was either uh, completely procedurally generated or at least uh, modeled and then procedurally animated using the same um, the same data that the music uh, basically the data that comes out from the music sequencer. Mm. Um, the idea for it was uh, I've always been making electronic music, but I always felt like there was this missing. Uh, visual part of the experience uh, mm. like even when i'm listening to music i would you know at some point maybe i'm listening to music while i'm working and at some point i had to stop because maybe just the right combination of sounds and just the right rhythm uh makes me realize that i'm i'm going through this like visual journey mm. and nobody around me can see it i don't know how to express it but it's beautiful mm. um and so I yeah I spent some time doing some research and trying to figure out how can I make some of this music and also bring out that visual part of the experience that I have, uh, which is partly synesthesia and partly just I guess daydreaming. Um, mm -hmm. So so in that track uh, that track was a, it was trying to be side trance uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, or at least trying to get as close as possible to it. And so it was specifically trying to uh, display what I imagine or feel when I'm listening to Psytrance, which is this like sense of speed uh, through space, I guess. Um, mm. I, thought, I, I thought it was really interesting because the, the thing is, if you listen or watch them independently, they're still entertaining, but you put them together and it creates like five times the amount of power and energy when you sync it together. And I was kind of like almost trying to catch my breath by the end of it because it's like a roller coaster. Because once you're sort of being sucked through the galaxy towards uh, towards uh, another point in space, you're sitting there just going, "Whoa, this is crazy!" I mean, how long how long did it take you to to, to put uh, this? You know, in VR, it's a full genre, the roller coaster videos. <laughs> so this does feel like <laughs> really like a roller coaster as you're going through it. Um, and actually, that's probably also part of uh, the original idea. Uh, yes, together they they go really well because they. So the the thing I like about it is that it really doesn't have a story. But I think when you get to the end of it, it does feel kind of as if you've been looking watching a story, similarly to how when you listen to a a music track and the music track isn't maybe doesn't have the words, isn't really say isn't really saying anything specific, but it has a structure to it that emotionally kind of resembles real life stories. Mm. There is like a build up and then a pose of uh, balance maybe, and then a conflict and then an explosion of energy. Uh, and so I feel like the visual really just captures that really well because it's generated from the, the sound itself. Yeah, I mean, I t my, my takeaway from it as well, which is, I always think of space as mechanical, like spaceships and stuff, but I, I added organic element to yours as well, where you have something that's mechanical potentially in front of you, but then surrounded by things that are maybe organic. And you can get the rhythmic parts with the organic parts of it and the pulsing with the, uh, the mechanical element of it. And I thought they both complemented each other quite well because it gave it almost a slight extra three dimensional film uh, feel to it when you're watching it because it's, it's it's showing something in in that sort of shape you have in the uh, in the middle towards the end, which is quite mechanical and man-made. But then around it, you can feel there's elements that are actually organic as well. So it's kind of like a merging of both both sides. I thought that was captured really really well. All right, I like that. I like that interpretation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the thing in the middle is like uh, uh, I don't know. I. Like, I like everyone, I like to hear everyone's take on it because like everyone sees something slightly different. And when I was making it, I also myself wasn't really sure what it was. In my mind, it was, yeah, something like a AI generated thing that does 
<laughs> something. I don't believe what I say. I mean, I watch hundreds of films. I mean, I'm just I've got I've got literally short short uh, short burn on the brain. Basically, I think like my interpretation is from watching hundreds of films all the time. Uh, but I always that's the thing about film. It's subjective. I mean, you know, one person will love a film for one reason and hate it for another, and and everyone has different opinions. I think when you have something that is visually and audibly led, uh, which your film is, then uh, it's very much open to interpretation and it's an emotive feeling at the end of it. And I think that um, it has no strict narrative. And the point is, and that's what you mentioned a second ago, is that actually, if you shut your eyes for a few seconds, you can start to make that narrative appear. It doesn't take much, it just takes a few cues. And I think that you're doing that with what you're making. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you for making uh, uh, such a, a beautiful uh, feast for the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. That's okay. And finally, John, as uh, so, uh, Malady of, of Mine. So Malady is uh, a word that means ailment, I believe, off the top of my head. Uh, possibly a play in words of Malady, if you're British. <laughs> um, but this was, uh, I, I made some notes about this. Because again, I thought it was a very pretty film that you, uh, that you made. And what did I put it here, guys? I, 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 this, these were my notes. So when, I, when I watch films, I'm always, I have to do a script uh, review and all the elements of the film, I like it, don't like it. And I generally write like my own log line. And I wrote one for yours very quickly because it just came into my mind. And I said, Heart is the art, is like art unless it drives you apart. An artist living a fractured and uh, incomplete life finds the true source of his pain. And it's almost like what you're trying to tell here is the story of living through art and being driven apart and living a life that you thought was complete but isn't. And I just thought it was such an interesting concept in terms of like, it's almost like the, the source of his pain is in part self-inflicted and in part forced and I thought it was a really interesting dynamic that you delivered. Thank you yeah um, yeah you know I've, I've always been fascinated with uh, the connection between kind of like inner turmoil and artistic output um, and so Maldi of Mine was it was really meant to be an exploration of the kind of the myth of the troubled artist. Um, mm. You know you look at some of the you know, the most successful artists over the past couple hundred years. And um, some of the standouts were these really troubled individuals. You know, you look at like Sylvia Plath and, and Warhol. And, and um, I, I wanted to explore a character who kind of takes that notion to the extreme where um, he finds inspiration in a fairly dark place and he kind of leans in um, and you kind of, as a viewer, you're watching his life unravel and he becomes aware that it's the case, but he's, he's so like addicted to the, um, the fuel that it's providing for his artwork that he, uh, he kind of willingly enters himself into this vicious cycle. So it's kind of this like cautionary tale against, um, what happens when, uh, you take that to the extreme. Mm. I really uh, also appreciated the uh, the aesthetics that you put together for this as well because it's it's textured but also very flat. And I really liked the way that you animated it. Again, what was the uh, what was what was the animation process like for you? Um, and again, how long did it take you to put this together as well? It's another seemingly popular question we're asking everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, so I start to finish. This took about a year. Um, working on it most most of the time, not full time. Um, and yeah, the animation process, you know, my background was working in marketing and advertising where you have to create these kind of quickly rigged characters that are often vector based or, or fairly flat. Um, and so I wanted to take that technique and try and infuse a little more personality into it. So that's, that's why I incorporated kind of these like rich textures and and lighting and things like that. Um, and the process was, was really, um, it was a combination of, of using like rigged characters, um, which sometimes can feel a little bit stiff, um, but also combining that with scenes that, that include traditional animation um, when I wanted the characters to be more expressive or where there was a move that 
wasn't really um, feasible with the rigs that I created for each character. Um, but they have a lot of amazing tools these days to, to really um, take these characters to another level with a single rig. Um, and yeah, the, you know, I, I worked with a couple really great um, artists and illustrators who helped just bring a little more um, humanity to, to the aesthetic. Um, I had a really great background artist and um, I actually worked with the primary source material for the film um, for the actual, the body of work from the main character is that of a real artist who's a friend, friend of mine, Camila Galofre. Um, and same with, with the landscapes. Um, I found this amazing landscape painter um, who graciously offered to uh, lend her artwork for the film. So it was, it was this kind of mixed media approach of, of um, these kind of like flat vector based characters with these textures that I was incorporating and then real artwork that I was um, bringing into the film. So that was definitely a challenge kind of rectifying all of the different pieces, um, but it was it was definitely um, a fun challenge and I'm, I was happy with where it, where it came out. Yeah, and I, I also think the other thing I found really beautiful about your film is the that bittersweet twist you have at the end of the film where you think everything's panning out, but actually the problem seemingly is with, with him. It's, it's never, he's never going to really be happy because his art's always going to hold back. So I always think that that was a really nice way to, well, not a nice way, it's obviously not, not a nice way, but you know, in terms from a writing perspective, a nice way of, of wrapping the film up. So again, um, where was, what was the origins? Uh, was the origins of this story just for, um, uh, is, is that from a place that you felt that you find that sometimes art can be a bit destructive on a personal level, or is it just, something that you've read or experienced from, from somebody else? It's definitely um, drawn from personal experience. It's funny, I've always found that when something is going wrong in my life, um, I have, my, my artistic output has been um, more inspired, let's say. Um, and it's, I, I recognize that that's kind of a dangerous thought pattern to fall into where you're almost seeking out these like, traumatic things as a way to fuel your artwork. Um, so it's definitely drawn from personal experience. And then it's also drawn from, um, you know, my admiration of some of these like really famous, well-known troubled artists throughout history um, and breaking that down. And ultimately the twist in the end is that he's trapped in this cycle. It's kind of this Sisyphusian um, tale, but, um, I think the, the the ultimate message is that he has the power to break out of this cycle when he decides to do that, and that the um, there there isn't just inspiration can come from uh, places that are not so dark as well. Um, you just have to maybe dig a little deeper to look for it. Yeah, and 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 obviously you experiencing that and watching the finished. Uh, the finished article. Have you found this quite a cathartic experience? If you you learn anything yourself from it, very cathartic. Yeah, and especially the, just the process of writing it um, allowed me to to kind of self reflect on my own experience. And and there were a lot of twists and turns in the writing process. But um, yeah, where it ultimately ended up was certainly cathartic, and it definitely colored my um, perspective on this theme for how I tackle it in my own life. Well, thank you again for making a cracking film along with everybody else that's been here today. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. We've zoomed through this literally in the Zoom um, and uh, we are at the end. I wish we could ask more questions, spend more time. I could do this all over again for the same amount of time and have even more questions to ask you. But alas, we have to finish. So it leaves me just to say uh, it has been a pleasure speaking to you all and I wish you all a great festival. Thank you to the audience for watching and we do hope that you tune in to what else the festival has to offer. Again, thank you all uh, for making these wonderful, wonderful pieces of work and the time and effort and strain that it takes being an animator uh, because there is so much hard work that goes into making these beautiful things. It's not just a five minute 
click of a button or a flick of the wrist and it just magically appears it's shedding blood so well done one and all of making great films and hopefully we'll be able to see you for real at the film festival not too soon when we can actually hug and actually have a beer and actually <laughs> have a normal life again so uh thank you everybody for being here thank you thank, thank you, you. Bye. thank Thanks. you